July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were taking the United States and the world to the surface of the moon. Houston, we got a 500 alarm early in the program, went to uh, descent one, proceeded on it, and we're back at uh, auto again. Over. Roger, we saw that, Buzz. Thank you much. Okay, I'm still on flu, uh, so we may tend to lose as we gradually pitch over. Roger. Eagle, Houston, it's descent two fuel to monitor, over. Under two. You're still looking good. Made it, uh, switch over time, please, Houston. Roger, we copy. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Okay, 75 feet. Guys looking good, down a half. Six forward. As they neared the surface, they saw that they were heading for a field of large boulders. Armstrong took control, overriding the automatic system, and guided the Eagle manually to a landing. Forward. Forward. Picking up some dust. 40 feet down, two and a half. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward, drifting to the right a little. Down and a half. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Now, with Mike Collins orbiting in the command module, man was on the moon. It was the result of teamwork on a massive scale. The checkout and launch at the Kennedy Space Center. Zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The superb Saturn V launch vehicle from the Marshall Space Flight Center, which pushed Apollo 11 into orbit and sent it on its course to the moon. reporting the roll and pitch program which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. The spacecraft and mission design and flight support of the Manned Spacecraft Center. The smooth, accurate functioning of the Manned Spaceflight Network of tracking, telemetry, and communications through the Goddard Space Flight Center. As Neil Armstrong climbed down the ladder to a new, yet incredibly old world, over 400,000 men and women symbolically descended with him. The men and women in government service, in industrial complexes, and in a network of universities who had made this incredible feat a reality. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The age of interplanetary exploration had begun. Armstrong described the dusty lunar soil as very fine, with a tendency to cling to his boots. It was, upon later analysis, found to be made up of fine particles, generally between the size of sand and talcum powder. Its constituents were minerals, plus about 50% glass fragments and spheroids. As for the problems of operating in the moon's one-sixth gravity field, Armstrong reported, There seems to be no difficulty in moving around as, as we suspect it. Uh, it's even perhaps easier than the simulations of one-sixth G that uh, we performed uh, and various simulations on the ground. Next, Buzz Aldrin climbed down onto the surface of the moon. Together, they set about collecting samples and setting up experiments. The solar wind experiment, a piece of metallic foil which would collect particles from the atmosphere of the sun for analysis on Earth. The passive seismometer, to measure seismic activity, whether impacts of meteoroids or originating within the moon and transmit the data back to Earth. And the final experiment, a device to reflect a laser beam shot from Earth back to Earth, eventually allowing measurement of Earth-Moon distances to within a foot. This experiment will not only allow accurate calculations of such things as continental drift, tidal effects, and so on, but could have a fundamental impact on basic physics. The portable life support systems worked perfectly, sustaining the astronauts for nearly three hours. Although Armstrong and Aldrin engaged in about two and a half hours of intensive work, and according to one geologist who watched them, accomplished more than most geologists would in a full day, they showed no adverse effects. Their heart rate stayed in the 90 to 100 range. Armstrong would later report that working as they did in the one-sixth gravity field produced no strain. Guidance steering in the ag. 
The next day, it was time for liftoff and rendezvous, the first time men from Earth would launch from the surface of another world. For this liftoff, the ascent engine would have to ignite. There was no backup system. At the launch site, a quarter million miles from Earth, only two men. Supporting them from Earth, hundreds of men. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, port stage, engine arm ascent, proceed. As with every other burn on this mission, the liftoff of Eagle's ascent stage was right on the money. The next job, perform the rendezvous maneuvers to rejoin Mike Collins in Columbia, transfer their precious cargo, and return to Earth. After recovery, they were flown to the manned spacecraft center for the isolation period in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. While in the laboratory, the crew underwent a detailed debriefing, relating their experiences still fresh in their memory information of great value for scientific and engineering analysis. During this period, the lunar samples received careful handling in decontaminated, specially designed areas to keep them in their natural and uncontaminated state for precise scientific analysis. Plant and animal tissues were also exposed to the samples to assure that they could not adversely affect the Earth's biosphere. As suspected, no harmful results were encountered. On August 10th, the flight crew left the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. Meanwhile, preliminary analysis of the lunar samples was continuing. Chemical, radiological, magnetic, and spectrographic analysis was producing results that were fascinating to the scientific community. The rocks, found in what has been considered a relatively young section of the moon, were three to four billion years old, as old or older than the oldest ever found on Earth. The magnetic and chemical composition indicated formative processes totally alien to the Earth. While the rocks bear a family resemblance to the earth rock basalt, they generally resemble no known terrestrial or meteoric material. On the basis of this preliminary analysis, several tentative conclusions have been drawn. The makeup of the igneous and brexia rocks and the fine soil indicate that lava flows have occurred, as well as impact formations. The rounded edges of the rocks and their sandblasted appearance indicate that erosion has taken place. However, no surface water has existed at Tranquility Base since the rocks have been exposed there for about 20 to 160 million years. The tiny glass-lined pits on the surface of all rocks tend to indicate impacts of small particles, and no organic material of biological origin was found. But perhaps the most exciting find is the age of the rocks, as old or older than any ever found on Earth lying on the surface of the moon. It seems that if these specimens do not take us back to the time of formation of the moon, rocks from other regions will. In the words of one scientist, the moon is very different from the Earth, and we don't understand it yet. On September 12th, 18 pounds of lunar samples were given to members of 142 primary investigating teams from 10 countries plus the United States for detailed analysis. And these were samples returned from one region on the moon, analogous to trying to understand the nature of Africa with samples only from the Sahara. One thing was obvious. Apollo 11 was only the beginning. More missions are needed. On September 8th, at the Kennedy Space Center, Apollo 12 began the first step on its journey to the moon, the slow rollout from the vehicle assembly building to the launch pad. Since Apollo 8, each succeeding mission had shown a refinement of technique, allowing more and more accurate trajectory calculations. Using this continuing pattern of sophistication, Apollo 12 would be aiming for another section of the moon and a very precise lunar landing target. Launch time, mid-November. At the same time, Apollo 13 was being readied. Its mission, assuming the success of Apollo 12, would be to land in the lunar highlands and return samples which could date back to the origin of the solar system.
Schedule launch time, March 1970. The crews of Apollo 12 and 13 were also being prepared. At the Kennedy Space Center and at the Manned Spacecraft Center, they were training for all aspects of their missions, including command and lunar module flight simulations, lunar surface operations, and acclimation to lunar gravity conditions. At the Kennedy Space Center, altitude chamber tests with flight crew participation were held September 2nd through 12th for Apollo 13. The flight of Apollo 11 had been a demonstration of a lunar transportation system. With Apollo 12 and 13, we would put this system into operation with a full program of lunar exploration. To further explore the moon and survey large areas, the astronauts need greater mobility. Vehicle concepts for lunar surface operations have been under study by the Marshall Space Flight Center and the Manned Spacecraft Center. During this period, Marshall Space Flight Center was preparing a contract for the construction of operational lunar rover vehicles. These vehicles must be capable of operating over the extremely rugged lunar terrain in a hard vacuum and survive and function reliably in an extremely wide temperature range. The transition to an operational system was exemplified by the completion of the last two Saturn 1B first stages built by Chrysler for the Marshall Space Flight Center. These are the workhorse vehicles for Earth orbital flights. Seven vehicles are awaiting their assigned missions in the Apollo Applications Program, while two are as yet unassigned. Manufacture and assembly of the Saturn V vehicles also continued on schedule, with work well underway on the stages for the 15th Saturn V, the final one to be built under present contracts. A major step toward the future is the Apollo Applications Program. This program underwent a major revision this quarter when the orbital workshop was changed from a wet to a dry concept. Under the wet concept, the workshop would have been launched as an active, fuel-carrying second stage of the Saturn 1B. After orbit had been attained, the astronaut crew would have prepared the workshop for living quarters and a laboratory. The dry workshop will be launched by a Saturn V and will use the wet workshop hardware and experiments. However, it will be completely outfitted before launch and will contain no fuel. Once in orbit, the crew can move in and start scientific operations almost immediately. In addition, the greater capacity of the Saturn V will allow the workshop and the Apollo telescope mount to be launched by a single vehicle, thereby reducing the number of launches needed. This is the forerunner of the true space stations designed to hold 12 to 50 men. In preparation for entering this age of space and interplanetary flight, the President of the United States in February 1969 appointed a space task group to present definitive recommendations on the direction of our space program after Apollo. This committee, composed of Vice President Agnew, Secretary of the Air Force Siemens, NASA Administrator Payne, and President's Advisor on Science and Technology, Dr. Lee Dubridge, gave their report in September. They recommended that this nation accept the basic goal of a balanced manned and unmanned program conducted for the benefit of all mankind. To achieve this goal, the United States should emphasize certain program objectives, including an expanded space applications program, support the objective of peace and security throughout the world, increase man's knowledge of the universe through lunar and planetary exploration, astronomy, physics, the Earth, and life sciences, Develop a new space transportation capability and space station modules emphasizing the critical factors of commonality, reusability, and economy. Promote a sense of world community through international participation and cooperation. The focus of this program, a manned Mars mission before the end of this century. As first steps, contracts were awarded for a definition of space station systems. Intense studies were begun, preliminary to the definition of space shuttles from Earth's surface to Earth orbit. Consolidation of our lunar foothold and further scientific exploration. Development of a new form of power, the atomic rocket engine. All pointing to manned missions to Mars before the end of the century. 
And in July, just a few days after men walked the moon, the mechanical electronic eyes of Mariners 6 and 7 scanned the face of Mars. As lunar orbiter, ranger, and surveyor preceded men to our moon, so Mariner points the way to men on Mars. The capability is there. In many cases, the hardware and systems are now ready. We have only to use them. In other cases, the concepts are nearing completion. Ideas are becoming reality. The flag of the United States was planted on the moon, not as a symbol of conquest, but of knowledge and hope for all mankind. That symbol is ready to be carried deeper into the universe. Now we must decide, not whether to go, only where and when.